I move slowly these days. I'm a chemo patient, and so I'm fighting another battle. It's uh, more difficult than finding army material. <laughs> Although that was a challenge. I, I want to say thank you to Stephen for his introduction. And I want to say thank you to Alan for an excellent presentation on the Las Vegas project. Uh, it's one that we've seen numerous times driving on I-25. We've never stopped and toured, but uh, it takes on more, more meaning as you hear presentations by him. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking as an expert because I'm further than 50 miles from home. <laughs> I happen to live in Albuquerque. But my work that Stephen referred to really was done in Springfield, Missouri. And that adds 750 more miles to the expertise, uh, being about 800 miles from, from here. Uh, my, my recollection of the story is that as a professor of history for 20 years, I was a fellow for the National Humanities Council uh, back in 1978. And I, I had a fellowship at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. And in the course of that work, we were encouraged by our director, Gene Holland, to identify a research topic that we would find interesting and I was looking for one that would drag me out of the 19th century into the 20th. And the Harvey Company bridges that very nicely. So starting in, in Topeka uh, in the 1870s and the family divesting itself in 1968, uh, the, the collection uh, that I searched for uh, had, had a lot of different elements to it. And I began at the Kansas State Historical Society in Topeka. There was a Harvey girl named Johanna George who, when she retired, donated a fine collection of Harvey material, mostly objects, to the Kansas State Historical Society. And though I didn't meet her, she was deceased, but her reputation preceded her. Uh, and, one that I used. Uh, in the course of my work as a history prof, I, I read a book about the history of the Santa Fe Railway by Keith Bryant. Uh, Keith was the dean of uh, graduate studies at Texas A&M University at the time. But he wrote a history of the Santa Fe that had about a chapter on the Fred Harvey Company. And in talking with, with him at conferences, he was, he was sort of discouraging me to begin the search. Well, as Alan has pointed out, Stephen has pointed out, and any number of you here in this room could point out, the search is the fun. That's the fun of it, when you seat buckle yourself into a chair and begin to write, that's the bear. And it's difficult to do, I learned, especially holding down a full-time job with the National Park Service when I changed careers. The course of the work then at San Marino was to read as widely as possible. Well, there wasn't a lot to be read. There was a master's thesis at the University of Missouri, Kansas City uh, by Henderson. Uh, there were scattered pieces of literature of, of dining on the Santa Fe in traffic from Chicago to LA or return. But in the course of the search, 
I, I stumbled across what was then called a, a publication called Hospitality Magazine that the Harvey Company established as a network for its employees and other promotions. And in that, in that literature, I learned in the Hospitality Magazine is that they began to microfilm records back, back in the 1930s, if not sooner. And it turns out that uh, when the family sold their interest in, when they sold the Harvey Company, they sold it to American Factors, which was a sugarcane company in Hawaii. And that company moved the headquarters from Chicago to Brisbane, California. Brisbane, of course, uh, isn't so well known, but South San Francisco is. And that's where, uh, through the intervention of Daggett Harvey in Chicago area, I was able to get a door or two opened. And, and Daggett provided me with uh, housing in his guest house for a couple of nights back in the early, late 70s. And, and then Helen Harvey Mills provided a few hundred dollars as a stipend for me to work with uh, to go to South San Francisco or Brisbane to see if I could find the records. Well, there's a lot of twists and turns about it, uh, and being in touch with AMFAC through Daggett, I was able to learn no one had the keys to the file cabinets anymore. <laughs> they, they had been packed, the records had been packed in an asbestos line series of file cabinets. And so what did I do from Springfield, Missouri? I packed my drill and my bits and I got on a plane and went out, and I drilled out those damn locks myself. <laughs> and, and it exposed a lot of things, including reels of microfilm. Um, this, this is not one of the reels, but there's several volumes of official payroll that I found in that warehouse. And you'll find some notable names just on a page out of this series of official ledgers. Uh, it's about a 10 inch high leather bound volume. I think there's seven volumes total. And so you can go back by month and year to look at some of the information that is available uh, for, for public consumption, although that remains to be determined yet uh, in terms of cataloging and indexing and all those finding aids that, re that researchers love to find, uh, especially if they don't have to do it themselves. Uh, consequently, um, this, this microfilm is about a two and a half inch reel it's 16 millimeter wide. They photograph documents and put it on the reels. Um, and it's not easy to work with. And I have a partial uh, index underway that is by topic, so that if you want to look at uh, public relations or employee relations or personnel matters, you could do that with, with, there must have been 300 reels that I shipped through AMFAC and paid for it. Again, it's the intervention of Daggett that made the difference. And I shipped them back to Springfield, Missouri, and if, if Stephen will advance uh, to the next slides. What do you want to say? Um, yeah, the, 
this, the slides will come later. Um, and I can speak about the, the microfilm then. But I donated uh, at least 300 reels to the Kansas State Historical Society because I determined that during World War II, the Santa Fe Railway provided a contract to Fred Harvey that provided meal service to the vets who were traveling back and forth across the United States. And mind you, they copied every receipt. Well, you get dizzy looking at a dozen, let alone nearly 300 or so. And so that they were a marginal use, I felt. And so uh, they went to the Kansas State Historical Society. I don't know that Kansas has done anything with them. I, th I think that they were intimidated by the number. They probably concluded, well, like I did, that who wants to read receipts about burgers and fries and Cokes uh, by the thousand, which was on the, on the records. But this page that Stephen has put up is from a ledger. There were ledgers that uh, were approximately uh, 18 inches high by about 12 inches wide, and they were bolted together. And so some of the ledgers are, are 8 inches thick, some of them are 3 inches thick, and often, if you wanted to find out how, how much liquor was sold at La Posada on a particular month, you could look at a tabbed sheet and it reports that period of information. It's, it's not uh, a continuous run, let's say from 1924 to 1948. It's intermittent. It scares me to think what ANFAC might have done with the records in Chicago. Um, dumpsters are pretty handy, you know. And as a historian, you're afraid of what's been tossed out, not just what has been located. Among other things, I don't have any pictures, but among other things, I had the blueprints for LA's Union Station in the collection that I found they were just laying in a file drawer, as were these ledgers. This, this gives you an example of what the ledgers look like. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's double page. You, you, you remember the old mimeograph machine? That was, that was purple on white. That's, that's what was used for duplication. And they bound them together. Uh, and these big, 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 big books. Uh, so that's part of what I found as my collection. Uh, here's, here's an example of a reel that had company records on it. Uh, not, not the meal receipts, but instead other documents that pertain to the company. So. If, if you were doing the history of the Fred Harvey Company, I contend that you need the collection that I was able to identify uh, in order to reconstruct the past. Uh, and, and consequently, uh, it's, it would be very, very tedious work uh, and, and challenging. But you know, there's, there's a group of individuals called graduate students. <laughs> and they often get the scud work. <laughs> and they do, they do marvelous things with it. For example, um, all, all the sheets of paper often are bound together by staples. Well, you know what happens to staples after a while? They begin to rust and it begins to eat into the paper. So one of the tedious jobs 
for an archivist or a curator or a graduate student earning three dollars an hour, you know, will be to remove all those staples uh, in order to curate them in acid-free folders and index and catalog them so that researchers can come along like Stephen and, and find advantages to what, what was done by the graduate students uh, or, or even undergraduate students uh, with some training. Uh, I, I have just made a, a decision regarding that something Stephen alluded to, and that is I'm donating the collection, the Fred Harvey collection, to the Center for Southwest Studies at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and, My pockets aren't very deep, nothing like Alan's. And consequently, uh, I can't afford an appraiser. You know, they, they start about $500 a day. Uh, and so I'm going to take some kind of standard deduction uh, because I had an appraisal of the reels like this before I donated them to the Kansas Historical Society. Uh, and and uh, my taxes were prorated over a period of a few years. It was it was a good tax break, thank you, Daggett. And consequently, it made made a, a difference that way. But I think that the important part is that they need to be properly curated. Uh, Jan and I, my wife and I, have moved from Missouri to Colorado to Utah to New Mexico, and we have carted that collection along. And it's been properly curated in the sense that it was in room temperatures that were steady. They were not thermographically controlled, but it was a whole lot better than in your garage. And so consequently, I think, I think that there's been very little deterioration but I'm not a curator. That's why there are folks that have training and education in that field. Um, moving, moving to another slide. This, this is going back. This is going back to that official payroll. Uh, the volumes that I spoke of a few minutes ago. If, if it hadn't been for Stephen and his staff, I wouldn't have had any PowerPoint presentation. I, I just am technically inept when it comes to doing that sort of thing. I need a seven-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> she would handle it with a whiz and a bang, and uh, Grandpa could hardly you know, get it, get it, get things up on the screen. But through Chan's efforts, we were able to get some photographs to Stephen, who completed uh, this this little PowerPoint presentation that gives you some some illustration without dragging a cart in here with with ledgers or all kinds of material. You, you, excuse me. Can I go forward to the picture? That you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, this is this is some young guy <laughs> in a South San Francisco warehouse trying to get a black and white photo of of this now old geezer when when he was much younger trying to pack up. And, and get the, the record shipped to Missouri. This, this gives you some idea of individual reels on shelving in a library once, once I had it shipped from, from South San Francisco or Brisbane 
uh, to Missouri State University. Again, Stephen. Uh, at the Special Collections Library at the University of Arizona in Tucson, the curator David Hebe uh, had a collection of black and white photos. And because I knew Alan was speaking, I thought it'd be fun to toss in a Las Vegas one or two. Because he's on the mark with, with all of the variety of National Register properties of, of Las Vegas. Uh, it's, it's rich, rich, rich. And it's one of those southwest cities, small cities, that has an old town and a new town. The history of the railroad is pretty fascinating. When the Santa Fe built, uh, they often left behind the old plazas, like they did in Albuquerque or elsewhere, including Las Vegas. So it's, it's a good study that way, uh, especially by historical geographers, looking at placement of um, the location of settlement and how settlement changed because of transportation uh, that came in later. I often think of uh, General Carney standing on the roof of the building next to the Plaza Hotel proclaiming the Southwest for the United States. Uh, of course, we we took it by force, clever us, from, from Mexico on, the, on some kind of a pretense about a river in Texas. That was the boundary. Only that river in Texas didn't come close to Colorado or Utah, or Arizona, New Mexico. But we're not bothered by that, right? We're, we're a humanity-focused nation. Consequently, uh, that's my wife is giving me this. I may not, I may not get out of this auditorium. <laughs> There's in the lower right is an example of one of the ledgers that had stamped on it, Fred Harvey Company, and the year that the records pertain to. Uh, don't you wish that you could have looked at Amfac's purchase in Chicago before they shipped it uh, to South San Francisco? Um, but what we don't know, I guess, won't hurt us. But we salvaged some things. I'll take some credit, but I've learned that, yes, there are scattered pockets of records, but Stephen uncovered an awful lot. And I, I had the benefit of looking through a lot of personal family things that Daggett had in, in large photographic albums, uh, in, including the little passbooks that were used by the Fred Harvey Company to, to obscure the movement of personnel and freight by the telegraphers who had a code that they used and a little, little pocket book that defined what, what it might have meant by Centipore 8 or some kind of railroad term that meant that six Harvey girls are traveling on the next train. Meet it. Um, in the course of my first summer in 1979 in Atchison, Kansas, we looked up the home of Fred Harvey. At that time, this house and the next few pictures, Stephen, you can put up, but this house was used by the Board of Education uh, for offices. Uh, I haven't seen the house uh, of late, so I don't know if there's a house museum 
or, or just what, but anyway, it's one, one of the remnants of the family uh, that still existed back in 19, excuse me, 1979, 1980. Is that the last? Yeah. Is that? Okay. Um, consequently, to finish up, when Stephen contacted me here in Santa Fe, I happened to have an office in the old Santa Fe Trail Building on Museum Hill. And next door was an empty office. So I, I simply all the records that Stephen was going to examine into that room and he had a place to work uh, and, and conclude that, that there are things that he would like to have more time to look at or he get in his research staff. But the, the important thing is that the collection got salvaged to an extent that um, there, there is benefit uh, to finding and, and the thrill of the search, which I, which I sense is true at the Castaneda and the Los Posada. Uh, it's, it's the enjoyment of, of the chase. And consequently, it's good to be able to do that sort of thing with the, with the manner of handing it off to someone else so that they might mine the records. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Anybody have any questions for Jerry? Yes, got it. I am not able to answer when the collection will be able to be used for research. I think that the funding source is often grants that you get from various nonprofits or organizations to help fund the work, and that's very unpredictable. And it's much more unpredictable these days than it was five, eight, 15 years ago. We will, by the way, uh, you know, I'm speaking at UNM on Tuesday. Um, Jerry will be there and Tomas Jan will be there, who's the librarian of Special collection. So I think uh, if you come or you can have somebody, we can ask them as well. Uh, I mean, this, this collection is literally moving next week. So uh, Jerry's had it for a long time, and he's been extremely generous, I will say, not only in letting me use it, but when other people have had requests, and we often, during the course of the Fredhead weekends, have wanted to query the system, the system being Jerry and Jan in their house, um, and they have gone and looked for records. What a system. Yeah, they've, gone and looked, they've gone and looked for things for us and sent us uh, pictures of them. Dag. First of all, we're very grateful uh, what you've done to Bobby visit. It would have been thrown away. And I wonder though what dates approximately and how complete the corporate records would. For instance, if someone were curious about the company sales and profits in the 1960s, would you have that? Yeah, I, I don't I don't have information for the 1960s tag. Uh, unfortunately it's scattered. Meaning I'll have 12 years of records and then it will skip six or eight years. And and so that's the fear of the damn dumpster outside, you know, Ampac's Chicago headquarters is that somebody pitched it. But that's my imagination. And that's that's a historian speaking uh, who got stymied, but I think Stephen has proven that things do appear. And so there's always the hope that there's a couple of nuggets out there someplace 
and you'll find them. Somebody will find them. And that's why it's important to get the collection process and being used, because that's how you identify more gaps and maybe you send somebody on the chase uh, to search and find. I would also say, having been through some of the records, that while only certain years are preserved in total, like all companies, the Harvey Company would often query its databases to be able to compare things over years. So they will, you can see in the records them asking questions, and some of those questions go back into the 1800s. So it depends on what year, you know, if they, some year in the 30s, they say, we want to know how much Grand Canyon made every year from the time we opened it. So there are individual things like that. There are also, since you brought up Harvey House, it's interesting, one of the most wonderful things Jerry has is the entire lawsuit uh, where the Harveys tried to preserve the name Harvey House because a restaurant in Philadelphia was using it illegally. And while this is interesting to me in Philadelphia because the restaurant was actually down the street from where I work, and the last letter in the pile, which was this high, uh, was to my old publisher, Philadelphia Magazine, telling him to stop calling the restaurant the Harvey House. What's miraculous about this lawsuit is that lawyers in the 50s, you're driven by your dad, um, had to gather all this information that otherwise would have been thrown away to prove that the Harveys had been using the name Harvey in their restaurant name all the way back because they had never actually called a restaurant Harvey House, but they wanted to be able to preserve the name Harvey House and stop this guy from using it. So when you save corporate records, you don't know really why things will be saved. The other thing is there is lots of letters between your dad and other people. And I will note that many of them are not, these are pre-staple. They are held together by pins. Yeah. Okay, so pin is driven through the thing. They rust too. That's um, right. So it, it's a fascinating collection that really, I mean, I got to spend some time with, but somebody who's really interested in the history of the hospitality business, which is obviously a, a huge industry in America, this is one of the best collections anybody will ever have to be able to look at the real hospitality industry from Chicago to Los Angeles and all these different cities over an incredibly long period of time. Do we have any more questions for Jerry? Yes. Um, this is a little bit side note. That, that was Fred Harvey's house that you were showing in the pictures a little bit later there. Is that what you were showing? I didn't understand. That. She was asking if that's Fred Harvey's house. That's, that's for the Fred Harvey family house in Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. I have um, a question. I said Atchison, didn't I? I yeah. Mean, Go ahead. When I was there a couple of years ago, it was under renovation. It like it stopped because of funding. Do they know when that's going to be finished? Or what's that? Actually, interestingly, uh, since this is the good year, good news year, we've had other years that weren't the good news years for Harvey history, um, the Leavenworth House is now back under more active reconstruction than it has been in a really long time. Um, and the eternally optimistic, but you know, kind of optimistic with a raised eyebrow, people in Leavenworth um, actually believe that in our lifetimes you'll be able to tour it finished. Uh, if you go up on their on Facebook link, you can see they actually have started painting the walls, and they've actually made a ton of progress. Uh, a lot of us were there several years ago when the National Archive in Kansas City did a Harvey Grill show, and uh, the whole family went up and uh, went to the house, went to the graveyard. Um, it was pretty cool. So Leavenworth, which has not been an easiest place to visit, I think increasingly will be a place you're going to put on your Fred Harvey map, uh, and that's a really cool thing. Yes, all the way on the back. I was, say, I was just there in May, and it is in good shape. And you take a tour of it, and they made the museum into the carriage house. So yes. I was just there in May, and cool. I I'll show him when I come down. Whatever. Excellent. Uh, more questions for Jerry? Okay. Again, I want to thank you so much, Jerry, for all your work.